So in, um, in prayer, I was thinking about sermons, series, wh- wh- where do we go as we begin this journey together? Um, last week, you know, we had our, our first Sunday together, and I was able to, to share some of my passion for the kingdom of God and what that looks like um, with the, the, the yeast and the 99. Another part of my DNA is that I am very much a follower of, uh, of the, the, uh, a student of John Wesley, so to speak. And John Wesley talked a lot about God's grace, which we know is sprinkled throughout the scriptures and talked about extensively. Grace is a major, major component of our faith. And he kind of identified three main types of grace. And it uses old language, but you guys might all already be familiar with this. We have the prevenient grace, which means preceding, the one that goes before. We have justifying grace, and we have sanctifying grace. And so we're going to spend three weeks just talking about grace, because it's an amazing, amazing thing. Anyone with me on that? God's grace is just so powerful. And so I want us to focus for all three weeks we're going to have this Romans passage, because in it I see all three types of grace. So if you're like me, you're welcome to take your bulletin and a pen. And you can um, just mark off the first two verses. So let's read those real quick. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, that one's easy. Justified, justifying grace. Um, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So we're going to talk about that next week justifying grace and then the next section verses three through five is really about sanctifying grace that's the grace that helps us grow into the likeness of christ and that talks about our suffering and perseverance and character and hope um, and that that it comes god's love has been poured into us through the holy spirit which we receive in baptism so we grow in that so we'll talk about that in two weeks And so it's out of order, but this week, the focus is on those final two verses. So again, you can put a bracket around that if you want and write prevenient grace. Prevenient. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. We're the ungodly. We are the powerless. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, God died for us. That's the grace that goes before. Grace that goes before. So will you pray with me? Loving God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. So how many of you are parents? Okay, a lot of you are. Not everybody, that's okay too. Um, I think you can still understand what it's like in some way to be a parent. And maybe you have a similar experience you can compare this to. So I have three. My son Micah is 10. And I remember the moment I fell in love with him. I remember the moment. It was in the ultrasound room when they put his picture up and they found his little tiny toes. Now I have to tell you, I hate feet. I fell in love with his teeny tiny toes. I couldn't believe that there was a a new life forming inside of me. It was amazing. Now to put it in the context of grace, he hadn't done anything but grow toes. He hadn't earned my love, but it was there and it was overflowing. And when he was born, after 25 hours of labor, Deliriously, I took him in my arms and I told him I would do everything I possibly could 
to make the world a better place for him. Because I loved him. And he hadn't earned it, and he didn't deserve it. In fact, he'd put me through hell those past 25 hours. But I loved him, and I wanted to make the world a better place. Now, I'll say there were times when um, he was particularly difficult to love. I don't know if any of you parents out there know that feeling. The first clue I got about that was when he started turning colicky. By the time he was four months old, I had gone back to work as a full-time pastor. And um, I finally was able in my sleep-deprived fog to time the number of times, to count the number of times he woke me up at night. And I averaged it out. I was waking up every 20 minutes. I remember one particular morning, one particular night that was really bad. And I am not an angry person, but I was filled with rage. I I couldn't handle anything. And I went to take a shower, which is how I try to wash away all of the all of the pain of my body and all of the exhaustion of the night and try to recenter myself on God. And this funny thing my mother used to say came to my mind. Don't judge my mother for this. She said, God made babies cute so you don't throw them out a window. <laughs> I heard someone say that's true. <laughs> And in that moment, I was filled with gratitude that despite all this rage inside of me, none of it was directed at my son. It was kind of incredible. And I know that's not a universal thing. There's some pretty bad things that happen because of how traumatic childbirth and early and, and, and everything is. In the, we know the news. But in that moment, I was just so grateful that I didn't have any desire or need to direct that at my son. He didn't earn my love, and he didn't lose my love in that moment. But more importantly, God designed babies and the hormones of mothers most of the time, in such a way that when I got to this critical point, I didn't throw them out a window. I didn't earn God's amazing design. My son didn't earn God's amazing design. God's amazing design and grace adjusted for the fact that we are human beings with weakness. God's grace went before I needed it. Are you with me? Maybe there's other moments in your life you can think of where God's grace preceded or went before you. When we talk about the journey of faith, prevenient grace is the grace that lets us even know that there's a faith to have. The grace that lets us know there's even a God to seek, a Savior to find, a promise that came before we even knew that promise was there. When we were colicky little hellions, God loved us. God cared for us when we did not have any reason to be loved. It's an amazing gift. And we see it in these scriptures that we read today. So so the fact that we couldn't even know Christ is in this first one, the passage from John. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me 
draws them. Prevenient grace is this act of God drawing us in, pursuing us, relentlessly persuading us into relationship with him. It's an amazing gift. And then down in the Romans passage, you can see how Christ's gift went before. So John speaks about, the the John passage here makes it clear that we can't come to Jesus on our own. God has to pave the way, drawing us near. But that that gift from Jesus was already present is clear down in the Romans passage. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We don't earn or deserve grace. You know, we're new to this relationship, right? I didn't earn a place on the, on the stage. I don't deserve a place on this stage. I don't deserve to be your pastor. God decided, God called me when I was 16 and said that he wanted me. And I said, are you sure? Maybe that's not God's voice. God hit me over the head with a two by four, but that's another story. (laughs) And made sure I knew that he had called me. Which is a really good thing, because I've never doubted my call since then. I'm very clear that God called me. But what I've done is raised my hand countless times and said, are you sure? Because I'm not very good at X, Y, Z. But God loves me just like God loves each one of you. And he wooed you into a relationship with him, and he wooed me into a relationship with him. And his grace has brought us together, and I know that that he is at work in justifying and sanctifying us as well. And so I hope to be a good pastor for you. Know that I will do everything I can to love you and be a good pastor for you. But the most important thing I can do is point to Jesus. Because it is by his grace, by his gift that went before all of us, that we are even able to be in this room. To know who God is and to follow him. In my sermons As I'm preparing, I always ask God, so what? What does this mean today? Some pastors reuse sermons. I'm not good at that. Because every time we look at the scripture, we are new. And God has something fresh to say to us. So what? What does it matter in your life that God's grace brought you here before you earned it, before you deserved it? I know for me, one of the things that God calls me to is to work really hard to love others who don't deserve it, to go before So when my children continue to irritate me, I continue to love them and to point to Jesus. As a church, I think there's something else that we're called to. And that is going to the people instead of waiting for the people to come to us. God doesn't wait for us to come to our senses and realize our lives are a mess and we need some higher power. God is at work from day one 
wooing us into a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? God comes to where we are. He sits down in the muck and the mire of our lives and says, I love you. I want to help you. And I think we can do this together. Amen? And step by step, God helps us climb out of the muck and cleans us off and gives us a new identity and purpose. But those are things for next week and the week after that. But God's grace starts in the muck and the mire. And as his people, we are called to also go into the muck and the mire. We are called out of our comfort zone, out of our pristine, clean, grace-filled, joy-filled, hope-filled churches, into the lives of our neighbors, into the lives of our community, because God wants to use us as his hands and feet to sit with others in their muck and mire so they look over at us and go, how come your clothes are so clean? And we can say, well, I got this God who picks me up when I'm down. This God who calls my name even when I'm sleep-deprived, exhausted, and angry, and lets me hear a voice of thankfulness. That puts me back on my feet and helps me walk again. Where, where in your life is God inviting you to woo your neighbor to him? Where, who in your life, who do you already know who needs someone with eyes of compassion and a heart of love to walk with them, to walk with them until they look over and ask, how is this possible? And then to turn and point to Jesus. It's a question I keep asking, and you may get tired of me asking. But I believe in the Great Commission. I believe with all my heart that Jesus calls us to go into all the world. And to make disciples. That means from the muck and the mire into eternity. To make disciples of Jesus Christ. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I challenge us to go. But first I challenge us to remember. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us.